You know what? I just don't feel bad and bougie enough to be doing this video with this look. Heat protection, always key. Right, you guys, it's wild what one little transformation can do for your bad bitch vibes, right? Today's video is me ranking all of the books that I read in first year for English. I should probably go and get my books, so I'll be right back. Oh my goodness. Oh, I actually didn't expect it to be this much. I'm not gonna lie. Oh my god, my laptop's in the way. Laptop, move. You're gonna get crushed. I can't film like this, so I'm just gonna move it aside. But it's a lot of books. Does it look artistic like this? Right, let's open the ranking what you've literally... <gasps> I'm fine. Let's get started. I'm gonna introduce the tiers and I'll probably pop them right here to explain them. At the very top, we are starting off with dark chocolate. If there is one thing that you should know about me is that I adore dark chocolate so much, like all the endorphins, they're juicing when it comes into my system. So dark chocolate means I love this book. This book is in my will read again list. It is special, made me feel things. It was just genuinely a top tier book. Second on our tier list is rather enjoyable. As the name suggests, these books were rather enjoyable. If I am inclined to do so, I may or may not read them again, but they're not quite top tier level books. In the middle, we have an emotionless meh. The reason I put this in the middle is because these books, they don't really make me feel anything, as in I'm kind of indifferent about them. They didn't really make me feel any particular sort of way, which is why they're like a bit meh. One level below that, we have the nope sis. It's it's an absolute no from me. The sun is being really weird today. Nope, sis, didn't like it, and that's that. And then our final level is let's start a bonfire, which means I very much despise this book. I hate it with all of my being. And if you told me there was a bonfire where we were burning all of the books, as you would, you know, in medieval times, you know, start a fire, these books would be thrown into the pile of books in the bonfire. So, you know, let's start a bonfire. We hate this book. Madame Bovary. Like I kind of have mixed feelings about this, guys, because it's it's not an emotionless meh because I felt very strong emotions reading this book and I don't know I think Flaubert is very talented and I wish I could read this in French like I hope one day my French is good enough to actually read this in French but my man Flaubert spent like three weeks on one paragraph perfecting the language and imagery of it. He spent years writing this novel so it feels bad to put him in the nope sis category but I really did hate the plot, the characters, well almost all of them, like I don't even remember her name right now, Madame Bovary. She was just the most annoying character I have ever come across. Like Charles was okay but he was a bit of like what we would call a simp nowadays but like in like an actual simp level version, not just like oh I'm doing this for my girlfriend but I am literally a puppet for my wife and will do whatever she says. I also hated the Rodolphe character, like he was just Ugh, worst fuckboy material ever. I just could not connect with the characters or the storyline. I'm so sorry for people who love this novel, but like our whole semester was about adultery and there were just bo better books on adultery than this. Cause like, I, I hated this character. I really, I really did. Theodor Fontana's No Way Back. I think it's in German, it's Unendlichkeit. This, I actually really enjoyed. I think I will put this in the rather enjoyable, purely because, so this was also part of all this adultery stuff, but it was done really well. And I think I really connected more with this story because it's not that you liked the main character, but there were so many other characters that you connected with, like his wife. Spoiler alert, if 
you don't want the spoilers but so like I'll put a timestamp to jump ahead to but his wife she commits suicide at the end and it was so unexpected and there's like all this action so the first like half slash three quarters of the novel is divided into him actually making up his mind to commit the adultery in like the last quarter it's like the repercussions of what happens after the adultery itself is literally happens in two lines so it's slightly anticlimactic but I think it fit very well with the story and it was very interesting to go more into the process of perhaps what a rational human being would be thinking if they were deciding to commit adultery guys I'm literally watching this back and I'm like no rational human being would be committing adultery can we just get that straight as opposed to Madame Bovary which like she, actually this woman oof. also I need to preface this by saying it has been a very long time it will have been in September it will have been two years since I studied and read these books so give me a break if I don't remember everything exactly but I do remember how we felt in seminar in our discussions and I do remember I really liked the pacing of this although I know other people found it slow um some people preferred Madame Bovary I did not I swear I don't want to I really don't want to butcher this name but my, my Spanish pronunciation is not the best the house of Iowa I think it's a y the, the double l sound it's a Iowa anyway em Emilia Pardo Bazan this was amazing I really enjoyed this as well. I would also put that in the rather enjoyable category. Again, there was something about how well the stories were interwoven together, how all these different plot lines came together and the language. I think there was like a shock factor to it as well. Like when I was reading it at some points, there were like some humorous points, some shocking points, some sad moments. There was a whole range of emotions that I felt while I was reading it. And as a reader, you want to be feeling more than just one emotion for example with Madame Bovary I was feeling I hate this storyline this is so terrible annoying this character there was no real change in my emotions and how I felt about her whereas in this you had more characters different storylines to focus on and also characters that had both light and dark in them as opposed to just good and bad characters which is kind of the stereotype I feel like Charles and Madame Bovary fell into I'm I'm gonna be honest the only thing I remember from this is like some weird marriage stuff happening with the priest dude I also remember this one scene because we discussed it in seminar and it's where the grandfather feeds his grandson wine and like gets his little grandson who's like five or something drunk on wine and we were all discussing about how like disgusted that made us feel the adultery in this book the priest guy and the wife person I think I did write a paper on this because I remember I didn't have the correct version because I got mine from a secondhand shop and they wanted specifically like another penguin version I think not this version because the page numbers were different and they wanted all of our essays to have those page numbers so I had to go to the library and borrow out the other version of it to check the page numbers it was such a hassle that's probably more of a me problem hard times as you can see I didn't read very much of it. This is probably one of the only books that I didn't fully read in first year because I usually read all my books. It's not that it was boring, I mean it was a little boring. If you know me, you know that I don't like Dickens at all, so I'm not biased or anything when I read Dickens, but it always just hits me where I'm a bit hmm when it comes to the fact that I know he only wrote so much because he was paid by the word or the page or something like that. My man was only after the coin which a great pursuit but doesn't make for you being a favorite writer of mine so I don't know I'm probably gonna put an emotionless meh for this one because I don't really have any feelings towards this and hence I haven't also finished it so I can't really judge can I until I have Anna Karenina again disclaimer I didn't fully finish Anna Karenina I had to write about it in the exam so I did a lot of extra reading around it so I'd be able to write about it in the exam when we had complete when we were going to the lectures and stuff a friend of mine he's from Bulgaria and he can speak Russian as well he's read Anna Karenina in Russian and we were having discussions 
opened before one of the lectures began. And I remember he said to me, yeah, I opened the English version of it. I read like two pages and was so outraged that I couldn't read anymore. Butchering Tolstoy's words. Honestly, fair enough because reading something in a different language that's been translated, it's so difficult unless, I feel like unless the writer themselves have translated it, they know their intention behind the words and everything. I will put Anna Karenina in rather enjoyable because we also did like a huge discussion in seminar discussing the differences between Anna Karenina's character and Madame Bovary's character and why Anna Karenina was a much more likable character even though like they both commit suicide at the end. Like why are these two women so different to one another when they have so many similarities in both committing adultery, having a child and committing suicide. What I do remember is that she was a lot more likable, like her character, she actually cared a lot about her child, which is a lot more than Madame Bovary did. Boom. Roasted. Pleasure by Gabriel Denuncio. I remember enjoying this, but I remember it took me a long, like it was annoying to get through because I knew I had to read it. But there are like some really like romantic -y bits here. I'm like debating if this should go in the dark chocolate because it was actually beautiful reading this. I cannot imagine what it must be like to read this in Italian because you know what? I will put this in the dark chocolate because it was annoying that I had to get through it. But when I had finished it and I went back and I wrote an essay on it, and then I also used it as one of my texts in the exam. I found myself with such a great appreciation of it and even the translation in English was just stunning. So that's complete. Moving on to all of the English modules. This video is gonna be long, I can already see it. Wuthering Heights. Now, Wuthering Heights is one of my favorite novels. I studied it in A-levels. While we were in A-levels, I read the book four times over. The first time I read it, I absolutely hated it. I hated Wuthering Heights. It's like, what is this trashy plot? Horrible characters. It's just awful. I hate it. All this stuff. And then we went into class and I remember Mr. Cattell, my English teacher, I was like, oh, I hated it. And he said, well, you know what? Tough luck. You still have to study it. And then studying it actually made me love it. So Wuthering Heights is going in my dark chocolate. It holds a very special place in my heart. And I think Emily Bronte wrote it absolutely beautifully. Reading it again and again you find new intricacies that you can connect with and different images that you can appreciate even more and deeper levels of meaning to everything. Although I will say when I studied it we read a lot of Gilbert and Gubar and if you know who Gilbert and Gubar are you know they're feminist critical writers I think that's what you call them. Their book Mad Woman in the Attic also talks about imagery in Wuthering Heights and there's a scene where one of the characters, I think Isabella, is that what she's called? Isabella wants this gun that belongs to Heathcliff. And they talk about like phallic imagery of like her wanting the gun. And to me, that was so far fetched. Like it could just mean power. It doesn't, and not everything has to do with like man versus woman. Or other than that, I found a lot of great ideas, like all these economic ideas around settlement and land ownership. I looked at the laws around 1834, very interesting. That's pretty much the revenge ploy that Heathcliff has in the novel. Great Expectations, it's split into three volumes, right? You didn't need the last volume. My man Dickens just wanted his coin and it was just so unnecessary, this last third of the novel. It made it drag on so long and it was just so incredibly unnecessary. And then the whole thing with the different ending and whatnot and which ending would we have preferred and all this. If it had been only the first two volumes, I think I would have put it in rather enjoyable. It dragged on so long. We're gonna put it in the nope, sis. It's not burn level worthy. Genuinely, there were some very enjoyable parts in it, but it just was not it. Then we did Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Everyone knows the story. You grow up, re well, not reading, but hearing about it in casual conversation because this is how popular this short story is. And it really is short, it's only 66 pages. So you can read it in like one sitting and just chill. The impact that it has is rather 
strange as the name would suggest. I personally really enjoyed it. I think it's going to go in my dark chocolate category because of just the, the duality symbolism within it. I am a massive fan of duality and alternate sides of one's personality. This idea is very appealing to me as a concept in itself and then the way that Stevenson also portrayed it was very alluring and the language was very immersive. Okay, the one after that was Mrs. Dalloway. Mrs. Dalloway was one of the texts that I didn't read throughout semester, but I ended up reading it the summer after first year. Tom told me he really liked it and I was like, you know what? I'm genuinely gonna put it in an emotionless meh. Not because I didn't like it, but because I really am undecided about how I feel about it. It was very odd, I guess. There were lots of different facets to it. What I really enjoyed was the fact that there were no chapters. It's like one continuous story that took you from one scene to the other and how like these characters are kind of all connected in very loose ways. I very much appreciated that and this whole time flashback, flash forward type situation. Reminiscing on your younger self, I like that too. But I just, when I finished reading it, it didn't feel like I'd read a novel. If anyone's read it, I'd like to hear your opinions too. I haven't read any other Virginia Woolf novels, but I have read some of her feminist essays. Those, on the other hand, dark chocolate. There's very much this strong feminist voice that I really enjoy. Like I write a lot of my essays on feminist issues as my English lit class from my A-levels would know. The Wasteland next. The Wasteland is a bit controversial purely because I've spoken to a couple people and they were annoyed with the fact that it required so much background reading and prior knowledge to be able to understand the poem in its entirety or even to read the poem you need like background sources with you. For me I really rather enjoyed it because I like looking things up and finding out exactly what this means and what that means but there's this conflict between whether poetry should be readable by the masses or if it can be anything and could be understood by like scholars and whatnot. I personally really really enjoyed it so I think I got so excited when I was reading this because I was at home with my parents. I found myself like every now and then going up to my mum and opening it and reading her a bit and being like this means this and that means that. So you know what I'm gonna put it in dark chocolate because I love that aspect of literature of really delving in deeper to find out what did the writer mean. This is also another controversial thing where people discuss the fact that does it belong to the writer anymore after they've written it. Of course we have to come up with our own assessments but ultimately authors in intent is so incredibly important as someone who writes themselves. I think you can appreciate the poem or work in your own way by reading it for yourself but then when it comes to analysing what were they thinking when they wrote this it's incredibly important to know intent and context. That was just a ramble but yeah. Is it a passage? Yeah, it's A Passage to India. I'm gonna put A Passage to India in rather enjoyable. And I wrote an essay on it too. So I think it's very well written. There are some concepts that I didn't understand. And when I Googled them for scholarly articles and stuff, I couldn't really find anything. So perhaps if I read it again, I would get a, even a deeper meaning from it. Moving on, literally this is the longest video. This beautiful, beautiful book. Oh my goodness, The Lonely Londoners is going in my dark chocolate immediately. This was so monumental in the semester for me. The way that Selvin used the Crayolan dialect in his writing, it added a whole new dimension to me of reading a novel that I had never experienced before. Playing with different writing forms, so the summertime section in this is one continuous line of text with no punctuation. It appealed to me so much as a reader but it also hit the senses of my being a writer. Like the whole dialect, Crayon dialect that he used, is such a powerful cultural tool to use in your writing. The ideas that he brings forth are relevant even today and this was written about the Windrush generation but the ideas that are mentioned in here and the commentary it makes on racism is still very apparent in today's world at 2020. So yes, 
my dark chocolate trumpet. I'm gonna put trumpet in rather enjoyable because I did really enjoy it. It's not quite dark chocolate level, but I think that's probably because of the mindset I had when I was reading it because it deals with very serious issues. And I think for me, what takes it away from being dark chocolate is the vulgarity of the language that what's his name is his sam is his son's name sam i think this book is so amazing in the way that it plays with language and metaphor especially the beginning where the reporter's words are bullets as we go through this novel because it is fragmented in different perspectives it's like unpeeling an onion you get a layer of new information and a hidden treasure with every layer that you peel off i couldn't relate to it on a personal level but i can actually no i will say there was one section in it where it's talking about music actually you know what i'm moving it to dark chocolate level because this one section where it talked about playing the trumpet I play music myself it was just such a connection emotionally for me and even though it was very vulgar i think it was needed and it very much fit the tone of that character very well and it also sheds light on how you can feel abandonment even though you've got a family and then finding out the person who you thought was your parent is really someone else that deals with the concept of recognizing that your parents are not just your parents but they're actual adults as well and coming to terms with that realization was something very important for me as reading this as I just become well not just but like I come into uni and I'd become an adult and I was living on my own and confronted with the reality of dealing with the fact that our parents are just people as well why do I love so many books this is <laughs> this is so wild <laughs> So by my coming closer to the camera, we should all discern my emotion, okay? Because this book, if I could rip it to shreds right now, I would. Now, let's just immediately place it in the let's start a bonfire category. Also, what's funny is Hadfield, she came to Stanza, which is like St. Andrew's poetry event. She came and she spoke and she like read her poems and stuff. And I was like, should I go and heckle? But then I was like, no, that's, uh, that's a bit rude. <laughs> that's a bit rude. She, this, this, this pile of crap won the T.S. Eliot Award. And I'm just here thinking uh, there was maybe like one poem or two poems that were okay in this, that were actually like interesting. The rest of it, absolute garbage. I kind of want to read some of it out to you just because of like how bad it is. Bide on this bit of broken biscuit and all its frumpy gods be thank it. Sobbing wimbrel, shoulder rabbit, poot, 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 poot. I'm like, I'm sorry, what? And what's funny is, here's the tea, guys. I write reviews at the end of semester because they're anonymous, right? I wrote about how crap this was and the fact that it was on the syllabus. And apparently no one wrote about this in their exam. So it was removed. It was removed from the reading list of the semester. And I'd like to think that I had a part in that, okay? Let's like whiz through the next couple. Orinoco. Again, I'm gonna put this in my let's start a bonfire because never in my life have I read a short story that felt like an eternity because this is the same length mate it looks longer but it really isn't 65 pages the same length as stevenson's short story but did it feel like that no the language is just it feels archaic when i was reading it it's written weird like there's capital letters randomly for nouns that i did not enjoy so it was a difficult experience while i was reading it it felt more like i was reading an account of something as opposed to being able to critically and use my like literature knowledge to analyze it absolutely not and then we get <laughs> this gulliver's travels I had read the children's version of Gulliver Travels, which includes books one and two. There are four books. 
do we put this in the let's yeah let's let's do it it's it's in the let's start a bonfire because i hated this with a passion the only good thing is that now i can make references to the huinims and you know some people will know what i'm talking about literally an explanation of how long this table was and how short that chair was just the most ridiculous book i have ever read section three was very random it was just traveling to all these different small places where they had weird customs like nothing happened it just told us about the different customs of places i felt like i was reading an information booklet as opposed to a novel the huinim bit was probably the only really interesting bit that i found because of this whole concept of having horses be in charge of humans and like having the roles reverse and like humans are seen as savages in this land but like it was just problematic there was just so many problematic things with this and i know tom would agree with me on gulliver's travels not being it pope we did the rape of the lock this is gonna go in my rather enjoyable so this is one of those ones that i liked it but i didn't really understand it until i'd looked into it so we're gonna put it in rather enjoyable because i would read it again but it's a bit different to t.s Eliot because t.s Eliot, i felt myself going like oh my goodness this is a world that i want to be involved in these are techniques i want to be using not that i didn't feel that with pope but just it's a very different style to modern poetry i want to read more pope as well so hopefully that ends up happening at some point Guys, God, I literally do not know how this ended up on our list of reading. We're gonna straight away put this into Let's Start a Bonfire because it is a journey to the west islands of scotland and the journal of a tour to the hebrides the only good thing to come out of reading this was ossian those of you who know will know about ossian i need to persuade tom to get a tattoo of ossian with me because i really want to get one and i want us to get it together but like obviously tom's not going to get a tattoo so we have to like we have to persuade him somehow that's the only positive thing to come out of this google ossian if you want you guys i don't know why it's such a joke but it really is it's literally a travel log it's like i'm reading someone's travel diary and I don't like it. Wordsworth and Coleridge's lyrical ballads. It's not like my favourite thing on the planet. It's kind of between rather enjoyable and an emotionless mess. I kind of want to create like another category now where I'm just like, okay, maybe I should put it in meh. Yeah, no, I did like this. Yeah, we'll put this in rather enjoyable. And then we have William Blake, Songs of Innocence and of Experience. I'm gonna put this in dark chocolate. I just think that illustration in this case made the most difference that it could make. Look at some of these beautiful illustrations. I just, like, it's just so stunning. The dichotomy between light and dark is just so well done in this i liked the fly a lot i think the fly was my favorite in all of this it's just short and simple and very effective and some very dark and some very beautiful i think we had tam o'shanter after i actually don't remember tam o'shanter i'm i'm not gonna lie i should have read this before i started this video i'm not gonna lie Okay, you know what? Because this is taking a long time, for now, I'm gonna put this in an emotionless meh because I don't have any feelings towards it right now. I'm gonna reread it, and then if I change my mind, I will insert it. <laughs> Northanger Abbey. We're gonna put Northanger Abbey. Why is it stained? Ew, what is that? Oh, what is that? Okay, regardless, we're gonna put her in Nopesis. I love Jane Austen, right? I love Pride and Prejudice. Persuasion is my favorite Austen novel, but there was something about this that I just did not enjoy. Like the story did not stick with me. Although the, the genre itself, she was trying to be satirical, which I did get, but also I feel like satire in a sense should be restrained to the pages of a short story. It should be not a novel. <laughs> 
which you know it's fine she's doing satire on the gothic novel some of it definitely made sense i enjoyed all of the stuff to do with gender and friendship and generational conflict i thought that was all very interesting but i also thought it was difficult to write about i wrote about this in my exam in the passage based question and i found it quite difficult i'm not gonna lie frankenstein my lady mary shelley oh my goodness we have i think we have a first edition copy in the st andrews museum here of this book this we're gonna put in dark chocolate because this is beautiful the fact that she was 18 or 20 i don't remember when she wrote this i think she was 18 or she was 20 i can't remember this was wild that she wrote this at that age and this always makes me think about how back in the day they were so much more knowledgeable early on about literature and all this stuff like she had read paradise lost by the age of like 15. our last book is the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner i'm gonna put this in rather enjoyable it was kind of a pain to read at first but as the story went on it got so much more interesting and we all know how much I love duality. I just think it was brilliantly written. The language is amazing. And it was kind of funny too. There were some bits that were really funny, like this Bessie character in court. I think it was in court. She says like the funniest things. So there's like humor in there as well. And the narrator stuff, we love an unreliable narrator. In Ooh, that randomly cut off, which we love because phone died yay that leaves my ranking complete and this video the longest video i have by far ever made i really really hope you enjoyed this i enjoyed talking about all these books actually and it's given me the idea to go back and read some of the ones that i probably haven't fully finished yet thank you everyone for watching today subscribe if you haven't already and give this video a like pop your post notifications on if you want to be notified every single time i make a video have a beautiful rest of the day or if your day is just beginning have a lovely day love you all and see you in a couple days bye st andrews is bipolar today it's literally raining it was sunny just a few seconds ago what is going on so i really um, my brain has like lost the plot this oh oh i need to check that oh love it when it's not an eyelash and it's sky's hair but i haven't gone yet and this is my mum said it's a bit of an embarrassment that I haven't got yet as an English student to go and see this museum. Making this video and my editing time, 55 minutes, which is fascinating. I've never filmed a video this long, I don't think, apart from like literally the first video that we ever filmed. My memory is actually a joke right now 